Now I have the pleasure to introduce artist and sculptor Janet Eckelman. Janet describes the world as her creative canvas, bold, beautiful, and big, literally. You'll see what I mean tonight on The Bash. Please join me in welcoming Janet Eckelman. It's such a pleasure to be here. I think this is more creative professionals than I've ever been in one room with before. Uh, you're looking at a picture of where I grew up. I felt a profound sense of isolation. I was either in my air-conditioned car or in an air-conditioned building, and there was no sense of a public realm in between. Off I went to college. I was a little bit of a slow reader, and I knew that I had to have at least one class that didn't have a lot of reading. So that's how I ended up in my first art class. It was drawing class. And don't worry, I got a B minus. I'm not very good at drawing, in fact. But there was an assignment. You had to pick one artist and follow their whole life. And I picked Matisse because I thought his paintings were beautiful. But what I discovered is that late in his life, he was confined to bed in a wheelchair, and even then he invented a whole new way of making images, the cutout series. And I thought, that's the way I want to live, where at any phase of my life I am on my edge, and there's no one else to blame except for me to keep me there, and of course no one can fire me. <laughs> so at graduation I announced to my parents, I want to be an artist, and my father says, did any of your teachers say you're talented and you should pursue this? <laughs> and I paused and I thought, I gulped, no. <laughs> but it's the only thing I want to do. And I thought the way that you became an artist was you went to art school, so I applied to seven art schools and I was rejected by all seven. So I thought, well, I'm going to have to figure this out my own way. And I moved to Bali. I had $300 in my pocket and a ticket, and I walked through the rice fields till I found this house. Uh, the windows didn't have glass. They were these flaps of woven bamboo, and I felt this connection. I could be inside and sheltered and at the same time connected to the nature around me, and I began painting and studying craft traditions because I thought, well, those are going to be my teachers things that have been passed down generation to generation, they've got to have some wisdom in them, and that will be the way that I learn. And so I studied ecot and weaving, and I learned to make batik, and I made stamps, and I started making these contemporary paintings uh, with batik. And an American artist named Robert Rauschenberg asked to see my work and curated the first solo exhibition of my work in the US. Now, I hadn't studied him and didn't appreciate how fabulous he was, and that's why I wasn't intimidated. <laughs> the truth. <laughs> so I painted for about a decade when I applied to go on a Fulbright to India. And I arrived, and the, I promised to give exhibitions for the embassy, and they rented these gallery spaces around the country and I had shipped all of my paints to make the work for these shows. And I'm waiting for the paints to arrive. I'm waiting. You can guess what happened. The deadline arrived, and my paints didn't. I didn't know what to do. It was the most horrible situation I think I had ever faced, you know, feeling like I had to deliver and I had nothing to, to make art with. And so I looked, and this was a place famous for sculpture, in fact, bronze, for you know, the Chola bronzes for a thousand years. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna learn to make bronze. I started learning to cast with the lost wax method. And it's now 10 weeks till the show and I've got a dozen little bronzes the size of my hand. <laughs> and I'm just completely perplexed. I didn't know what to do. But every day after I'd work in the foundry, I'd walk the one block to the beach and I'd get some exercise. I'd take a walk and go for a swim. And it was also the end of the workday for the fishermen who were reeling in their nets into these mounds on the sand. 
And at that moment, I was calculating in my head, like, if I want to make my bronzes big, how much is this going to cost? And I didn't even have enough money for the raw materials. And I looked at the nets, and I'd seen them every day. And I thought, whoa, that's another way to make volumetric form without heavy, solid material. And I began working with these fishermen. This was my first satisfying sculpture. I think of it as a self-portrait. The title is Wide Hips. <laughs> I pulled them up onto poles on the beach to take photographs for the exhibition catalog. And what I discovered was that the wind became a kind of choreography, and they were always moving and changing, and it completely mesmerized me. And it's important to note, I didn't set out to be a sculptor of wind. I was just engaged with my materials and making, and I stumbled upon it. And I think as designers, you may know that same experience. It's the act of doing and making that leads to like innovation or advance. I was invited to the Museum of the Center of Europe, and I met an old lady who made lace doilies, and it was the same knot the Indian fishermen had taught me, but they had these beautiful patterns. And I liked this fine craftsmanship it gave my work when you were close to it, but I was still longing to stop being an object you look at and become something you could get lost in. So I returned to India to make my first large piece of a million and a half hand-tied knots with this family of fishermen. And we brought it in this duffel bag to Madrid, Spain for a large art fair. I think they had 100,000 people within that week in Madrid. And one of them was the architect and urbanist designing the waterfront for Porto, Portugal. And he asked if I could create this as a permanent work for the city. Well, I didn't know how to take something ephemeral and delicate and turn it into something robust and engineered that could survive hurricanes. I had to find a material that could survive ultraviolet rays, pollution, and salt air, yet remain soft and fluidly moving in a hurricane. I found a PTFE, and then I had to solve the problem of proving to them that this could withstand 90 mile per hour winds. And I went searching. Uh, it turns out there's no engineering software for things that are porous and moving. Uh, but I found a guy who was an engineer for America's Cup racing yacht sales. And he helped me solve the twin challenges of precise shape with gentle movement. Then we had to find a way to pull the knots tight enough to, uh, to really survive these winds. And I went from factory to factory until I found one that was willing to explain how the machines worked and which variables could be adjusted. And we figured out how to make lace with an industrial machine like this. By adjusting the, um, with each knot, we just changed the length of the side of each diamond. And then we had to find a way to document this, like a language, to communicate this to an industrial worker how to make this ancient craft. So after three years and the birth of both of my children, we raised this 40,000 square foot piece of lace into the air. And what was most exciting to me was that it had lost nothing in translation from that idiosyncratic craft. So this is what I saw when I first arrived, this anonymous street. And this is what you see when you ride up the waterfront in Portugal today in Porto. And as I walked underneath... <laughs> Thank you. When I walked under it for the first time, I realized it was that feeling I had been searching for of being sheltered and yet connected to infinite sky. And really, I think my life was never going to be the same at that moment. I realized that. This is my favorite photo. No, I did not take it. <laughs> of course, I found it on Flickr. <laughs> What you can't see is there's a three-lane highway there. 
and there's no crosswalk. So everyone has gotten under there by darting through traffic. <laughs> this is how I learn about the way my works live, by seeing how people are sharing them in social media. And I got a call from a friend recently that um, Google Earth, you know, when you pull out in Europe where there's only one icon per country, that the sculpture had somehow become the icon for the country. Wow. And <laughs> it's so exciting for me when it takes a life of its own uh, in people's lives. That's why I make it and do it, really. So I'm going to share uh, some different design challenges that I'm facing. This is downtown Philadelphia, their beloved historic city hall where the original waterworks was. And I didn't want to use netting. And I was searching for a way to use water. These are atomized water particles that are so tiny that you can walk through in a full business suit without getting wet. And my idea was I wanted to trace the paths of the subway trains that are beneath ground, and so you can see them above ground, as if it were an x-ray of the city's circulatory system. And I wanted to give you something. If you pay attention, you know, you learn something you wouldn't have known. Like, there's more uh, traffic east-west at certain hours than north-south, and in fact, you've just missed your train. <laughs> I got a call from the from Germany, the Stuttgart Ballet choreographer knew that I worked with the choreography of wind, but could I work with the human body? And this was a challenge I had never contemplated, but was really excited to do. And I'll just show just a moment of this. get the idea. <laughs> Collaboration is really exciting to do things that you could never do by yourself. Uh, some of you may know this space. This is SFO Airport, their newest terminal, Terminal 2. And um, oh, go back one. I didn't mean to hit it yet. <laughs> They asked if I could create a zone of recomposure after security. How's that? <laughs> For a design challenge. And this is what uh, our response. I wanted to bring, I cut holes in the roof and the ceiling and brought these forms down through the holes. And there, even on the floor, there are these projected shadows that are embedded into the terrazzo of the floor. It's called Every Beating Second. Yeah. Send me a photo if you pass under it. <laughs> Post it to our Facebook page or something. Uh, I, actually, I love that about that piece, is that I'm always getting photos from friends, you know, because they're underneath it. The Vancouver Winter Olympics was planning to build a new ice oval, the largest new construction and they wanted an artist to help them make it feel less anonymous. And we created this together. It's called Water Sky Garden. And it's a, a regional, oops, back one. Downtown Phoenix told me they dreamed of having a civic space that would pull people together outside to spend time in their climate. I said, well, what's here now? They said, oh, it's mostly parking lots and a notorious strip club. <laughs> and we created together, her secret is patience. It takes a full year for you to see all the colored permutations of lighting that I've designed. And in winter, it's warmer colors. And in summer, it's cooler colors. And every night, it's just a little different. Thank you. So nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, in downtown Phoenix, I have a friend who has an office there, and one day, his attorney, the attorney for their firm, came and she had never been interested in art, had never visited the local art museum, which is quite a good one, and she grabbed everybody and she said, you've got to come see this, and there they were in their business suits, and she got them to lie down in the grass, fully clothed for work, and to look up at the sky, and there they were, watching the changing patterns of wind, like rediscovering the wonder of being here. It, it's important to me to, to break out of the traditional boxes of where we think art is and who can see art and who deserves to be part of that. And I, that's, that's what I really care about, bringing art into life. This is downtown Seattle. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation reached out to me and they asked, could I give their mission a visual form? <laughs> I mean, these guys are like, you know, curing malaria and polio, eradicating forever, and I just didn't know what in the world to do. Um, their core belief was that every person on our planet deserves a chance for a healthy, productive life. And I thought, I don't know how to make a form that expresses that. And I thought, well, for me, it's waking up for one day. I can deal with thinking about one day and to see that day in full color. Like, not to be colorblind, you're still alive, but you don't see the full color. So I stuck a camera on their roof and recorded the sky, and I measured the sky's color saturation through the course of a day. So that is that shape. And then we began prototyping in the studio, and then we've been developing custom software tools to model these new ways that I'm working. And so there is the form, and, oops, auto advances, oops, I'm gonna let it, there we go. So I wanted it to just blend with the sky as the, the clouds are moving, the weather is changing. It becomes this transparent, translucent interaction with nature. And that's a permanent work. Thank you. If you're ever in Seattle, anyone can go and see it right there in downtown. But the, the idea that I had was that I wanted the color of sunrise that's happening in real time at each of their offices around the world to be projected onto the sculpture in real time. So it's literally connecting you to the fact that right now it's evening in Seattle, but the sun is rising in Beijing. There we go. And so the colors are changing, and if you pay attention, you can find out that actually this is the time that they're just waking up to begin the work in another part of the world. That's a detail. <laughs> so the fibers um, are this PTFE fiber that is 100% UV resistant, and then the, the ropes are made of a fiber that is 15 times stronger than steel. So those dark white lines are that really strong fiber. So this is Boston um, before the big dig. This highway cut the city off from its waterfront. It was nicknamed the largest parking lot in the world. They came to me, and um, after the big dig, it, it looks like this now. This ribbon park has replaced where the highway was, and they said, could you help us with an artwork that speaks to the reconnection of our city with this park? And my thought, when I was a kid, I used to play Jacob's Ladder with a string, and so my sketch was like, well, what if we could just sew the city back to the waterfront? We shut down all the streets downtown, we brought in seven cranes, a hundred ton crane, and we began lifting this sculpture into the sky. It's engineered to 110 miles per hour, which is the same as the requirements of the skyscrapers that it is attached to. And it's attached to these three high rises and they are all privately owned. So everybody had to work together in order for this to be 
brought into the city. It's, it's like a physical proof of what we can do when we are in symbiosis, when we are working together, we can do things that seem impossible. And it's a, it's a reminder for me of that. This is a part of the city where no one ever uh, would stop. It's kind of, somebody told me that um, this made them feel safer after the sculpture was there. And like no one ever had lunch there. And you can see between 3 a.m. when the cranes came in and 11 a.m. when this uh, video ends, and people are already having lunch there lying down in the grass, which is really exciting. It's like, yeah, we can change things. So here's behind the scenes in my studio. This is this custom software that we're using, which enables me to put in the thickness, the weight, the stiffness of every piece of twine and every knot so that I can see it with gravity and understand its relationship to the city and the fact that you are always in motion. Your experience is dynamic. So my understanding as a designer has to be understanding that dynamic and changing path as you experience the work to create the right proportions in relation to the city. On the left is my render from our software, and on the other side is the real photograph, unretouched with Photoshop. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, that, I'm clapping for the computer scientists and the computer software. Um, they did an amazing job. So here you can see the linking between the buildings. We went through the surface or facade of the buildings into the core because the loads were up to 100,000 pounds at a single point. So we had to go through and then grasp the core of the building, the steel core. And what's important is this sense of translucency for me that it's, it doesn't block out the city. It becomes a layer of memory that we see through of meaning and pattern which is meaning for me. And the reflections of, of the work interacting with the glass surfaces of the city and the wind. Uh, the first time I lay down on the grass and I looked up, I was with a friend who's doing a lot of meditation, and I looked up and I thought, it's like the sky is breathing. And I'll let you just spend a moment just seeing the wind. I think that's one of the things I love the most about this practice is that the best part about the artwork has nothing to do with me and I have no control over it. It's this ever-changing choreography that unfolds from, from nature. <laughs> this is the best audience I've ever talked to. <laughs> You're the best. <laughs> Vancouver, the TED conference asked if I could create a work for their big anniversary that spoke about people gathering to think and exchange ideas. And I was thinking back to Rome, ancient Rome and the Colosseum. They had a textile covering suspended by ropes that was called a velarium. And I wanted to think about like where we've come today. Instead of watching violent spectacle, we come to share ideas. And today, we're here to talk about creativity. And so I thought, what the question I, I asked myself was like, well, what would a velarium for today be? And with my engineers, we stretched across 750 feet, the largest pre-stressed rope structure in the world. Whew. It was scary, honestly, <laughs> as we leaned over the building. So we're attached uh, between two skyscrapers, looping on to the columns of the buildings and the roof. And we first modeled this with gravity to understand its form, and then with wind. And we had to get it right, and we had to pull it. There's the translation from computer rendering to the physical reality. <laughs> okay. 
So this is what it looks like when it arrives. It's one piece and one crate. It's like your grandmother has knitted you a custom sweater, only you are the city. <laughs> Every rope is spliced by hand in a way that I think a thousand years ago, right here on the waterfront, people were splicing ropes the very same way. So there's something about embracing our history and these, these methods and techniques and materials that have been passed down to us from our ancestors. And we pulled it up. Uh, of course, it got caught in the trees. <laughs> And then it was 50 feet too much to the left, and it weighs, you know, 2,000 pounds. <laughs> we had a few challenges there, but we did get it up. That's Nate hanging up there. And I reached out to collaborate with the data arts team from Google. That was Aaron Koblen. And they created this interface that anybody on any cell phone could become a co-creator, picking colors and making gestures on the work. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, let's get that video running. There we go. So everybody together was making this artwork, and nature was also making it with us as the wind and our joint interactions created the live experience. I'm going to close with one more series the Tsunami series, I, it started with a call. The city of Denver was hosting the Biennial of the Americas, and they said, we need an artist who can express the interconnectedness of all the nations of the Western Hemisphere. Can you do it? <laughs> I had absolutely no idea, but I said yes. <laughs> so in my terror, and let me tell you, it is still terror. Every single project, I never know what or how we're going to get there. But I faced that terror by going to research. So I'm reading, reading, reading. They had just had a, a terrible earthquake in Chile. And I saw this video of the tsunami rippling across the Pacific Ocean. And I thought that was a metaphor of how something that happens in one part of the world is affecting all of us in ways we don't always know or can't measure or see. And then I saw that a NASA scientist had measured the effect of that earthquake and tsunami and the, the effect on the Earth's rotation, that it shortened the day by 1.26 microseconds. And I thought, that is the title of this work. Like, I didn't know you could change time. Like, I thought time was something like death and taxes, like you could never escape the march of time, you know? <laughs> it like rocked my world. And so I, I wrote to Noah, I, just an email off their website, and I said, you know, I'm an artist. Could I please, you know, use your data set to create an artwork about the interconnectedness of nations? And they said yes. So we took this data and we converted it into this. Now, this is early. This is before we had any real software. And so this is how we did it. I actually just unearthed this photo. I don't show this normally, but I knew this was a group of designers who would appreciate the truth. <laughs> uh, we didn't know how to make it, so we did a, an analog. Um, basically, we, we gridded out a piece of net, and then we had push pins on the top of that form, and we just adjusted it. And then we scaled it up. You know, Back in the Renaissance, they would use gridding to take something small and make it big. And so we gridded it up. And it was uh, the summer. And so we asked the hockey rink near our studio if we could go in there. And we took blue tarps, spread them out, gridded it up, and we made a full-scale template for the sculpture. Old school. <laughs> and this was our first completely soft sculpture, which made it so light that it could lace in, this is the facade of the Denver Art Museum, without any extra reinforcement. So it was literally part of the fabric of the city. And because it was light, it could now travel. This is Amsterdam, where we faced boat traffic as a new design constraint. <laughs> that was a new one for me. <laughs> Just makes me laugh looking at it. And there, all the temporary rafts go away, very light on its feet. You see, and then it lights up. 
And this was in winter to bring people out of their isolation. And this is Sydney, Australia, over their busiest intersection. Singapore. The annual scouts had their, their once a year sleep out underneath the sculpture. It's just Prague. Montreal, where it's been until this week. Oops, back one. And today I got the email. It just arrived in Santiago, Chile. So it's fifth continent. It is now going back to the, the sort of source of its piece. I'm really excited about it. Thank you. And um, back one. Did I? Yeah. Uh, the series I'm continuing, it's one uh, with another. I need it to go back one slide. There we go. This is another tsunami. This is the tsunami that hit Japan and the Fukushima nuclear plant. And I've been thinking a lot about this because I think the designers who, who built the seawalls to protect that nuclear plant were doing their job. They looked at the entire historic record. It's just that nature had something that was beyond our historic record. And it's humbling as a designer. And I wanted to work with this because it's about the interconnectedness of our actions with nature. And I have been developing it for an indoor and an outdoor site. So this is the design in the render now that we have software. <laughs> and this is the site. This is uh, in Washington, DC at the Smithsonian, the Renwick Gallery, their grand salon. and. This is how we translated it to this historic building, the first museum in America, across from the White House. And here we go. Uh, they required me to make a, to have a carpet underneath it, which I hated and didn't want. And I said, well, OK, I'll have to make my own carpet then. And this is my first carpet. And people are going in and lying down to look up and watch the changing colors and the shadow drawings that are moving across the wall. And people have started Instagramming. And I discovered our first lady, Michelle Obama, posted it on her Instagram feed, which is so exciting for me. <laughs> thank you. Half of that photo, thank you, uh, is shadow. Those are the projections of colored light on the walls. and. The outdoor site was London. This is the busiest intersection of the entire city. And we got the mayor to shut it down for four nights as we were installing. People are still trying to dart through traffic. And what surprised us is people started lying down on the cold asphalt. It was January, and it was the coldest weekend of the year. And people were there to have an experience, like retaking our streets. And you can see them. They actually had to make the tube station at Oxford Circus exit only because there were so many people. They didn't want people to get crushed. Um, this is the projection mapping going on behind the scenes that I know many of you understand and know. And I want to just recognize that this is a team sport. None of this would be possible without working together. As we all know, our colleagues are the greatest asset in making our work. And the last thing I will say is that we just brought this sculpture from London. It arrived here. It's up for your bash tonight. And so I look forward to seeing you underneath it. Thank you.